Um, so before we get too far into the webinar today, um, I'd just like to let everyone know that this program will be recorded. Your names as attendees won't be listed in the final recorded version. Um, but if you do ask any questions, your name, um, we may refer to you by name. Um, if you don't wish to participate in a recorded presentation today, you're more than welcome to leave the program at any time. Flying Arts would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and seas on which we live, work and create. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the unending connection of First Nations people to this country. We support the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to voice treaty and truth. We value the contributions of First Nations artists, creatives, artisans, practitioners and communities to the work that we do. Um, I'm joining today from Mianjin, Brisbane, uh, the lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people. And if you do know um, the traditional owners of the lands on which you're joining on, please feel free to type them in the chat box in the bottom right hand corner. If you have any questions today, um, you're more than welcome to ask them in that chat box throughout the presentation. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, our wonderful presenter, Alex, may choose to answer some uh, as she's presenting, but it's more than likely that for the structure and flow of our discussion today, we'll get through the presentation and then um, answer some questions and uh, have a bit of a discussion at the end. Um, and without further ado, um, I will hand over to our presenter today, Alex Stalling, um, for this presentation, Teach Your Craft. I can already see a question in the chat box here. Um, and I, so um, just to answer that quick question, Andrea, um, the structure of the presentation is a webinar. So our participants and attendees here um, won't have any video or mic access. Um, it will just be Alex and myself as presenters today. But if you did have any questions, you're more than welcome to put them in the chat box and we can answer them and facilitate a discussion on your behalf. And good afternoon, Anna. It's wonderful to see you. Oh, sorry. And there's a second part of the question. Um, if you wanted to oh, fill the main screen, um, you should have the presentation in the main screen and um, Alex and myself should be uh, headshots at the in the top corner. Okay, wonderful. Um, so Alex, I might hand over to you at this point to kickstart the presentation. There's a little bit of content to get through and then if there are more questions, we can answer them at the end. Um, so thank you, Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm really excited to talk on this topic. Um, I would also like to take the moment before I start to acknowledge the Yagara, Gaibal and Jawa peoples and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, with the questions, um, there will be a whole lot of content that I'm going to go through. I've tried to pack as much information into this session as possible for you to get as much out of it as possible. Um, so, yes, if you have questions, please pop them into the chat box. Um, please bear in mind that we will be answering those questions at the end. So try to uh, have as much information or content in those questions because I might not um, be able to remember exactly which slide or um you know, point that you were responding to with the question. Okay, let's get started. Um, so this is the big list of things that I have chosen to go through with you today. Uh, some of those might be things that you're already familiar with and some of them may be things that you might not have considered before. Um, with that, my work comes from, I work in a workshop space. I actually host and run workshops as my primary source of income and uh, over the last 15 years I've run a whole range of workshops and I truly appreciate the individuality that running and hosting workshops offered just as our practice as an individual as a fingerprint so is the way that we can offer and host workshops. So I have tried to put as much information in this today 
that um, no matter what kind of a workshop you're thinking of facilitating, there will be something that you'll be able to take away from it. Okay, let's get straight into it. Okay, so the first one is your audience. Who is your target audience? Uh, this is a really important thing to understand. Are you working with adults, children, the general public? And then, of course, you can niche down from there. You can be um, targeting a specific demographic, cultural group, region, um, you know, whether you're looking for professional artists or maybe someone who's beginning. But um, knowing your target audience is going to really help you in um, your ability to define um, what you're actually going to teach and actually um, access the people that you're wanting to work with in this particular workshop that you may be thinking of doing. Um, now, the other thing to consider is where where is your workshop going to be housed? And when we're thinking about audience, uh, this could be considered as are you running the workshop as a standalone event that you will be um, advertising to your networks and pulling your audience in? Or will you be a part of another venue or event um, happening? Things like that would be are you working inside of a shopping center, a gallery space, a festival um, or some other local um, space? Uh, because when you're working in those other spaces, there's a lot of other things that you need to consider. Um, if, say, I'm going to just use an event, like a festival, as an example, if I'm working as part of a festival hosting a workshop, will there be other artisans and, you know, creators within that space that are also going to be um, facilitating workshops? And so when we're starting to plan out our ideas, we need to be considerate about what else is happening. And um, even though all of our practices are individual and unique, it's really important to understand that if you have two people that are working kind of similar, then that's fine, but you really need to differentiate who you are for your audience. Uh, there's also, if you're working within, say, a shopping centre, they may have an audience that they already want you to then cater towards. So you won't be building and then finding your audience, you'll be building for an audience. And that's two very different delivery models when it comes to actually defining who your audience is for um, your workshop. Then for you, um, do you have an existing audience? Are you thinking right now, um, I keep going back to watercolor, but I'm going to teach a watercolor workshop and um, I have a really engaged audience that's been asking about this and so I'm being responsive to their needs. Or are you working from the ground up and you're thinking I'm going to start building workshops, that's going to be my main source within my practice or where I'm pushing right now and I need to find an audience and bring them into that journey with me. So audience is a really important thing to consider because they are a part of the process. A workshop is a, participa a participation-based um, you know, um, connection activity. The next thing to consider is our location. And there's two primary locations for this, and then they umbrella out in, into the many different ways that they can be delivered. So the two ways that most people consider when delivering workshops is in person and of course digital. So when you're looking at a in-person uh, workshop, so that's a face-to-face, -face, actually physically in the same space together, um, there's these things that you need to consider. The first is the venue and where you'll host it. Do you have access to a venue right now? That could be uh, your home, your backyard, you might have a functioning studio, you may hire a space that you have ready, um, you know, readily available for workshops. Um, and that could be that straight away, you've got it solved, you know where it's going to be. If you don't, well, you need to find a venue. And then um, if you're a part of an event, um, will they be providing an event? Uh, venue space marquee for you or will it be an event with satellite um, workshops happening as well that you'll then need to consider um, where exactly you're going um, to host that workshop as well which then goes back to those first two points do you have a venue or do you need to locate a venue there's things to consider when working in public spaces Will you need permission to use that location? An example of that is if you're thinking the lovely um, the local park might be really lovely, Depending on your activities and what you're wishing to conduct there, will you need to have permission from um, your local bodies to be able to actually operate in that space? You may not be able just to walk down and pop up and host an event or a workshop there. 
And then there will be, when you're talking about location, uh, what items you'll need to provide. Now, this isn't talking specifically to the items for the workshop. This is talking to the, the items to make the workshop function. So will you need to provide chairs and tables, tablecloths, gazebos? You know, would there be things like access to a kiln or power, um, running water, those kinds of things. Um, if you're working at an event where you're needing to pop up or bring everything to it, you know, these could be considerable cost, um, you know, things that are going to drive the cost up. If you're then having to bring all of those things, because not only are you having to source those things, but it's also transport and help and actually getting it to that space on time. Um, when you're working within like a location event where it's a pop-up and, you know, this could be a real space for that um, negotiation with your other partners there where they might be able to provide those things for you at the space and you can just come. It really is a case-by-case -case situation as to what will work there. So then the other main things to consider with your venue is the size, um, availability and cost. So is it big enough for what you're wanting to do? It could also be too big. You might have a massive shed that you will then find yourself having to shout across um, and that could be something to consider as well. Availability is a big one. If you're thinking, I would like to host a workshop next month and there's nothing available, you either need to play, you know, change your dates or um, tweak the way in which you're going to deliver it. Cost is a really big thing to consider. Um, costs are things that we're going to have to cover or factor into our budget. And sometimes the absolute ama perfect, amazing um, space ever just might not be within our costs. So we do need to be realistic about what is you know, viable for us in our practice. And the last one um, is a really important one is if they meet the requirements for the workshop, which includes safety. A lot of people choose to and have the opportunity to partner with uh, hospitality venues, which is fantastic. They're really great viable partnerships. But at the same time, um, if you're working with chemicals, um, you know, there is a safety thing to consider whether those things should be available where food is being served. So always, you know, think about whether the actual location is actually perfect for what you need um, rather than something that just feels really exciting. The second location is digital. So it's where will you host this event in a digital platform? Is it going to be on your own website, on a partner's website? Are you going to be putting it into um, like a content um, space, somewhere like social media or uh, YouTube, those kinds of things? Um, it's important to know where you're actually going to be putting your digital content because you will have to create to what that space requires. Um, the other thing with digital content is, it's, is it going to be live or evergreen? So live is what we're doing right now. I'm having a conversation. We can chat. Live can also um, talk to more of the meeting setup where everyone's in the space together. There's more back and forth and it emulates uh, the in-person event the most. It's obviously not got all the benefits of an in-person event. It offers other benefits, but live is that where you're getting as close to being an in-person event. Evergreen content is something that you would produce and people can access it at any time. It could be for sale. It could be free, however you want to do it, but you're not there. You make that thing once, you put it out and then people can access it whenever. There's also a nice little hybrid between, which I would actually say, you know, um, this this format is that nice format where I've got that live portion of it, um, but it's still very one way right now. Um, I'm giving you a lot of information, but where it's at in between is at the end, there is that opportunity for you to actually engage with questions and we can have that more one-on-one -on -one personal um, discussion about the content within the workshop. This could also be done with a forum or maybe a group set up afterwards. Um, you will need to consider what uh, setup you will require. So for me doing this today, the things that I needed to consider was a suitable location, uh, the actual physical laptop, a webcam, a mic, and a nice light that you can't see here to bounce all that. It wasn't just simply me opening my laptop and here I go. Um, the same things will be considered for if you're delivering online or digital content. Where are you going to film it? What materials will you require? Will you be doing this yourself as DIY or will you be working in partnership with a production company and how will it be edited and who will look after that and so on and so forth? 
Uh, when we're thinking of digital content, most of us immediately think of online. That's just where that default sits. Uh, but it can also include print and DVD production. So the same steps that you would go to to create your digital for online, you could then translate for creating a workbook or a DVD. Um, the reasons that we would consider these things are for accessibility and appropriateness of delivery for your content and audience and your audience expectations. Uh, the easiest way to explain that is some places just don't have great internet access and we could make really great content that they can't actually access. So we need to work around that. And that is something that is a very real Thing. Um, and I've had to work on projects where we've had to have um, print and DVD content to be able to reach a wider audience. All right. It's a lot. I know. <laughs> so the next one's the fun one. It's our content. Like, what are you actually going to teach? This is the part that you're probably going to not need a lot of help with. You probably already know this. If you're here and thinking about workshops, there's I'm going to make a, an assumption here and assume that there's something that you've stopped at one point and thought, I could teach this. So what will you be teaching? It's ultimately up to you. Um, some, yeah, you could teach from beginners to expert. Um, you could do a whole range of um, courses. You could just do one course and do it over and over again. You could just do one course for one particular moment. Um, it could be, yeah, so a standalone or a series. I, I don't know about you, but myself, I get overwhelmed with ideas. I find as soon as I start writing one idea, I'm like spider webbing off into other ideas and then I'm just overwhelmed and I'm like, I need to narrow this down. So I'm very analog and I like to write everything out on a notebook with a pen and paper and I write everything down, all the different ideas that are coming to me and I will start to then work backwards through that. I'll start pulling common threads and working out, hey, this is a great idea, but it realistically needs to be broken down. That's a lot to do in a, a, a short three-hour workshop. Um, it needs to be something that's, you know, over 10 weeks. Or maybe you've got a few ideas and you're going, well, actually, this can be brought together into one big coherent workshop. They're not really standalone items by themselves. Um, doing this will also help you keep a little bit focused. I tend to uh, have a little bit of a goldfish memory sometimes and get a bit excited about things. And so um, by having that list, it's telling me that this is a possibility, but I'm just going to focus on that one thing um, and develop that into that particular workshop. Uh, when it comes to developing your content, um, uh, actually from when you've got your idea into the workshop, I start with the outcome. So say if I'm going to do a workshop that's teaching people how to watercolor plants, I would have my, at the end, they will have a watercolor of a plant. I then step through the processes to get to that outcome. And I go right back through to everything. And I have learned over the years to never assume anything and teach everything. Just because something to you has become so natural that it's like breathing, that you don't even consider it, this could be the first time that someone's being presented with something. Don't assume that anyone has prior knowledge and, you know, really gets that way also when you're teaching people uh, on the same page as you. It's also really important to have that conversation about how you're teaching from your own interest and your own practice and the things that you do. Um, I all the time bring up to other people that if they're serious about this and they want to keep going, they should definitely be getting into workshops as well with other artists. Learn from other people because, you know, for me, there's no real right one way. We kind of just pull on the different parts of different things that work for us to build our own way. So when I'm teaching, I always like to bring it back to this is the way that I like to do it. Have a go at it if you like. If you feel comfortable doing it in your own way, go for it. But just presenting people with those options. But definitely do not assume. Teach everything. You have a really beautiful wealth of content um, that you may or may not um, realize that people honestly would love to learn from you. The next thing to talk about is the duration of the workshop. Um, workshops obviously come in a whole range of things. So there's like the short stop and taste. This is something that I would say at a shopping center or a major festival where people can drop in. Um, 
And they're, for me, when I'm planning those things, it's more about offering access. They're having a bit of a go, but we're really starting that conversation. And it's a way for me to connect with other people and start to get them to think about ways that they can engage with um, the arts as a whole, my practice and what I do. And so the, the stop and taste, I have to be considerate of, is it going to be something that, you know, someone can pick up with basic instruction and be able to play with it and we can engage a little bit further? Or um, is it something that I'm going to need to teach? Because they're very different um, platforms. Then you've got the beginner to intermediate sessions. So that's your like, you know, hour to five hour. They can be longer, I'm just giving some rough guides. But, you know, like you come in, we're going to try something, learn some skills, finish it all up and, you know, off you go. Let's do another one kind of thing. Um, they'll be a little bit more intensive and this is where you're getting a little bit more control over the target of your audience. It's not like the stop and taste where it's just happenstance of people walking past and be like, I would like to have a go at this. This is where you've got people who are researching a little bit, seeking it out. You're able to give more information and you're really starting to target that audience. You then have the weekend intensive style. This is a bigger plan. So over a weekend intensive, depending on the medium you're working with, you might be having to have multiple lessons within your workshop. And it's not just going to be um, just that single focus. But again, it could also be something that's more labor intensive. So if you're doing a, you know, reduction lino cut print, then that just physically requires more time to do it. Um, so that might just physically require more time to actually host those classes. Then you have the option of multi-day, week, month course, and it just keeps going. So how you uh, deliver your workshop and picking the duration will be based on um, your needs. Sometimes it does go the other way, though, and you're presented with your limitations. And they will tell you, I would like you to come and do a workshop that lasts for an hour for this particular age bracket. And then you will then have to work backwards and think about, you know, your different ideas and think, what can I deliver successfully within those um, time um, constraints as well? So duration can go both ways. You can start with your concept first and build your duration up to it, or you can start with your duration and fit a concept within it. Resources. All right. So resources are the materials that you require, the physical stuff that you need to do, make um, you know, attend your workshop. It's important regardless of whether you're providing those materials or whether your attendees are providing those materials, you will need to know what those materials are. So whether you're, um, you're creating a list to hand out or to purchase, you really do need to um, unpack exactly what it is that people need for this session, there's nothing worse than getting to a session and realizing that you or someone else doesn't have something because then you then need to problem solve very quickly on the spot. So materials, don't forget things like water jugs, towels, paper towels, clean up, you know, supplies, all that stuff as well. And safety equipment too. Um, and then there's the equipment that you require for your resources. And this is things like hair dryers, ovens, so we need access to power, a kiln, um, a printing press, the physical sun, air, all that kind of stuff, space for things to cure. If you're in a workshop studio that you're hiring, do they need to stay overnight? And then that's also something you need to consider as a resource. Then you'll think about where you are sourcing these materials. Are you buying them from a local shop? Will you have to buy in bulk? Is it wholesale? Is it something you need to physically collect and forage and build up over time? And with that comes the time um, requirements. How long does it physically take you to get all those resources? If you're having to you know, buy something from overseas, then it could take three months. If you're having to re um, go and scavenge or wait to collect something that needs time as well, it's really important to understand how long it's going to take for your resources so that you're not left with the last minute um, rush of trying to locate things, um, particularly locally um, and particularly now. Um, I don't know about you yourself, but I have definitely um, found myself struggling sometimes. The things that were readily available with some of the supply chain things to not just be able to go down to the shops and grab what I need. I have to be extremely organized and planned well in advance before my workshop starts. All right. <laughs> funding. Um, so funding is where's the money coming from? That's essentially it. Uh, will it be self-funded? 
the main uh, version of this is selling tickets. So are you going to be, you know, pay to play selling tickets for your workshops? Um, or will you be looking for grants and sponsorship? And the other one is, are you going to be paid through a contract? So where the money is coming from will also determine your planning and your timeline. With your, uh, if you're looking for sponsorship and grants, you will have to know when they're open, when to apply. And even if your workshop project fits within what they're actually, you know, funding this time round, you'll also probably won't be able to start doing anything, advertising or putting anything out to the public until you know if your grant has been successful. That's most, I think it's always a part of the conditions with grants. Um, and the same with the contracts, you will have to plan a little bit in a he ahead for a contract sometimes to be able to pitch your um, projects and then, you know, they will be pretty set out in exactly what that is and the money sort of comes all in at once. But uh, funding and understanding where the money comes from is important for you when planning, uh, particularly with your timeline. So understanding that is crucial. Don't overlook it, please. Okay, so now we're getting on to budget. Uh, this is the really intense stuff. I do have some formulas coming up though, so get ready to take a couple of screenshots. I'll tell you when. Um, but when it comes to budget, uh, the big thing is I think most people, when they ask me about this kind of stuff, they want me to give them the exact numbers of something. And the thing is, this is a personal um, choice, how much we price things, how much things cost. Um, but when we are doing our budget, it's really important to be honest and to cover our costs and pay ourselves accurately. Okay, so when you're creating your budget um, and price for your workshop, these are the things you have to consider. Time. So time is not just the physical time you're in a workshop. I know for myself, uh, I've had this conversation over and over where people have seen that I might be hosting a three-hour workshop and they've gone to the maximum number of participants. They've multiplied those two numbers together and they've gone, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things they're not considering within those prices and I wish that it was a whole bunch of money, to be honest. Okay, so the thing with time is your planning, your marketing, your research, Procurement, so that's buying of, of the materials and resources. Um, documentation, so that's taking your, you know, photos and video content and everything. Your preparation, so if you actually need to make something um, to advertise or, you know, maybe you need to prime things and get things ready. Your design, so the graphic design stuff, whether you're DIYing that or outsourcing it delivery of the actual workshops, actually going in and teaching the class. And then, of course, the cleanup and follow up of everything that goes with it. Um, your hourly rate. Now, again, your hourly rate is really, really individual. And um, with this, there's a few places because I'm not sure exactly where you're at with pricing um, yourself out for these kinds of things. It does get easier if you haven't done this yet, I promise. And um, that first time might feel a little bit nerve wracking um, to say, this is how much my hourly rate is. Um, but I, um, yes, it does get easier. That's, that's the best advice that I can give you with that. So if you're unsure of how much to charge your hourly rate at, it is, Check your industry standards. Um, see what they recommend to be an hourly rate for the service that you're offering. You can also find an award. Um, there might be something that's very close to what you're sitting with, or if you're unsure, check at the miscellaneous award. It's going to be telling you where you should be um, sitting and what you should be considering. The other thing that I've often told people is if you are having trouble um, pricing yourself, then imagine if you had an employee or a subcontracting to someone else and how much would you pay them? Um, there's something about that removing ourselves with it that we can find easier and be a little bit um, more objective about it. So there are things that we also need to consider within our hourly rate and that's ATO requirements. So penalty rates, tax, super. Um, we often work in like, on weekends and things when penalty rates are applied. And if you do get to a point where maybe you want to subcontract out and 
this is something that you know it will grow bigger then you need to have these systems in place already because otherwise you're going to find as soon as you subcontract you might have not actually been paying or charging enough to be covering the costs of doing that thing okay so the next thing to consider within our budget is our materials so will you be providing the materials for the workshop or will you be um, asking the people to uh, provide those materials for themselves? Uh, with materials, it can also be broken down into hosting a once-off or reoccurring workshop. So a once-off workshop is I'd go to a festival, they're telling me I need to prepare for a thousand people, I'm gonna buy a bulk amount of supplies for a thousand people, there's my materials cost. A reoccurring workshop would be, I know I'm going to start teaching a series of watercolour workshops. I'm buying palettes, paper, pencils, brushes. Um, they're going to last uh, longer than a single workshop. So I average it out and work out how much, you know, of those supplies it's costing me to uh, have one person use them. So that's your per person cost. Your administration costs are things like your annual costs. So your insurance, uh, licenses, web hosting, membership, um, there's a whole bunch of them and it depends where you sit as to exactly how many administration costs you may have. Um, it's also important to remember that you should not pass your annual administration costs of your entire practice onto a single ticket um, and that it should be more of an average of, of costs that comes across your different classes, workshops and um, tickets. Then we have our uh, venue. So with our venue, that's things like lease, rent, hire, those fees, uh, your electricity, your insurance, and other costs that come with it. Maybe there is uh, Wi-Fi and internet access and things like that. But anything that's associated with your venue costs um, need to be factored into your budget. Okay, we're still on budget. Okay, so creating the formula is, the next slide is the formulas. Okay, so creating the formula is um, your hourly rate um, by the total number of, total numbers of hours involved in the workshop. So that's all that stuff that I was talking about at the beginning with your hours to consider. That could come to a total of, um, you know, six hours in total. Um, then your materials, you need to know your cost of either the bulk or the per person. And then you need to know your administration costs averaged. Now, how you average them is entirely up to you. You might be running one workshop a week. So that workshop needs to cover um, that week's worth of your annual um, classes. It may be once a month. It could be once a day. Um, however it works out, but yes, average those costs. And then, of course, the venue costs relevant to the workshop. If you have a permanent residency, again, you work out how much, you know, on average each workshop needs to cover to cover those costs. If you're hiring a venue, it's much, it's really simple. They'll say it's like $10 an hour and you're there for five hours. Okay, so here are the formulas. Um, I'm going to go through these. I've tried to make them as easy as possible and even still they make me think this is really difficult. So I'm sorry, but I will explain this. All right. So your formula one that we're dealing with is your bulk event pricing. So again, this is going to a festival. They've said, I want to pay you to run a three hour workshop at the festival for um, 10 people. And um, yeah, and you're just gonna do that. So I've worked out on this, on those rough numbers that, well, a three hour workshop actually cost me six hours of my time in total with everything else around it. And I've put my, my rate there as $45 an hour. So that costs $270 for me to run that three hour workshop with the planning as well. Then I'd said my materials for doing this workshop is $250. And then my average venue uh, cost is uh, $20. And then my uh, workshop so my average administration cost is $20. My average venue cost is $60. And it comes to a, a nice neat number of $600. Um, with your hourly rate, you might be saying that's really low. I've looked at other hourly rates that are available um, in different places that list how much you should be charging per hour. And that could be anywhere between like 80 to like 95 um, an hour. That for me is that 
I would charge that and I'm only charging them for the three hour workshop because I have worked out that that works, that sort of that high rate covers um, all the planning time within it. But again, these are just, these are my made up numbers. You charge the hourly rate that you um, need to charge. Uh, remember, you are a skilled professional and uh, your hourly rate needs to reflect this. So then my formula number two is a uh, per person ticket. So if you're selling tickets, uh, this is how I work out the costs of that. So my, um, my hourly rate is divided, so my total hourly rate, which is 270, is divided by the minimum number of students, not my maximum, my minimum number. Because sometimes you have slow days and you only hit your minimum, and sometimes you have great runs and you hit your maximum all the time. It will average out. Um, it's always important to work off your minimum, not your maximum, because if you're working off your maximum and you're not getting your minimum numbers, then you're not covering your costs. So my hourly rate is my um, total hourly rate divided by my minimum number of students um, equals, so that's 45, so I've said my minimum number is six. And then my per person materials cost is $20. So my administration and venue averaging costs are divided again by my minimum number of students. And then that RX set to be 13. So when I put 45, um, 20 and 13 together, um, that's 78. I rounded that some other way. It was something with sense. But anyway, I just made it a nice neat number. And then on top of all these things, if you're registered with GST, you've got to remember GST goes on top. Don't um, Because GST essentially comes to you and then straight out um, for tax. So please um, include GST if you need to on top of these costs. All right, so that is that slide. Moving on to the next one. Partnerships and collaborations. So these are a really great way to uh, share our resources and um, help each other out. Um, healthy partnerships are really great for everyone. So you can get uh, partnerships through places like councils, community groups, small business, large business, huge corporations, you can go as large as you want, um, festivals and events. And it's cross-promoting, like I said, it's that resource sharing. And what it means is that those places can have the benefit of your services without having to organize it themselves in-house. And you can have the benefit of working within their networks and you know the things that they can offer, uh, again, without having to go and try and um, do all that work yourself. So their healthy partnerships are a fantastic thing. To find these sort of connections, uh, you can advertise that you do this. Don't assume that people know that you offer a service. And if, you're, uh, if you've already, I'm just gonna use social media, if you've said on social media that, hey, I'm really excited to be able to partner with anyone who's looking for activations and you know, uh, workshops and um, cultural you know, connective activities, don't just leave that there and then ignore it for another 12 months. Talk about it regularly because your audience might not see it that first time. Um, and if they did, they may need to be reminded two or three times that actually I would like to connect with that person and I should do that. So constantly tell people of the services that you would like to offer. You can cold call people. Um, you don't have to physically call them though. You can actually just send out emails or maybe a letter depending on where you're working with. Um, but again, it's just that they may not see it on social media and they may prefer a more personalized um, you know, form of communication in that. You can also respond to call outs. People will ask for artists to come and host workshops within their um, different events and festivals and spaces that they're running. So definitely do those things. Um, that gets easier, looking for work and promoting yourself for work and also work breeds work. Uh, the more that you get out there and do it, the more people see you, the more people will think of you for their next thing. All right, um, insurance and risk assessments. <laughs> so insurance, um, public liability, um, product liability, indemnity, there's a whole range of different insurances. It's not a one size fits all. Please do not assume that um, just because it says it's a particular type of insurance that it covers the activities that you're doing, read the fine print. 
and make sure that you're paying for a policy that actually covers you. You don't want to be wasting money on that. Um, particularly when you're working with children uh, or if you're working in larger spaces, some places only offer, you know, um, 5 million um, public liability and they actually might require 20 or 30 million. So it's really important to know that you have the insurance that's best for um, what you're needing it to cover. Licensing is another one. Do you require it? There are certain things that require you to have a licensing or a membership to say that you can actually do those things. Then there's blue cards. If you're working with children, get that in advance. Don't wait till you book something and then like panic for two weeks that hoping that it's going to come in time. And then there's also, do you require qualifications? I've just put art therapists and disability support down there. Um, certain areas in um, those fields are sacred titles. And so you have to have certain qualifications to be able to advertise that you're working and offering workshops within that sector. And then, of course, there's risk assessments. I know it can be boring. But um, the higher up that you go, uh, there is always the expectation that you're going to be able to offer a risk assessment, particularly if you're working with um, chemicals and they will require those things. It's also a good practice for yourself to just be in the habit of doing these things. Um, we don't want to be putting ourselves at risk or liability and doing this is something that we should consider no matter how small um, our workshop is. These are the things that we do um, should be doing. Um, the other thing with risk assessments is doing your own um, due diligence. Don't assume because someone else is doing something very similar to you in a situation that they have done this, it might not actually be a safe activity to be performing. So um, always do your own work and don't assume just to sort of go along with the crowd. Okay, so then we've got the how to teach. Um, for some, teaching really does come naturally. Uh, for others, we need to practice. There's no a real trick to this kind of stuff. Um, it just comes with time and doing it a few times. You will learn to be able to adapt what you're teaching to the situation. Uh, 40 kids, in, you know, under 10 in a room, all very excited, are going to need a different teaching methodology than you would of, you know, a handful of adults, even if you're teaching the exact same workshop. And you will get used to being able to adapt what you're teaching to the situation. Um, it's just about, you know, getting out there and having a go. It's also really important to understand your own limitations and establish your own boundaries. You may not be interested in teaching children, and that is perfectly fine. You do not have to teach children. And so you also might not be interested in teaching adults and only want to exclusively work with children. I find for myself, um, it's great to have that network. And so with that, I uh, we bounce back and forth to each other. We constantly have people recommend stuff for us and we're like, that's not what I'm interested in. I would recommend you chat to this artist. This is exactly what they do. And then it comes back and forth. Don't box yourself into a corner where you're doing work that's not what you're really interested in um, because you're just taking up time when you could be focusing on finding work that you do want to do. Um, so when you're actually teaching in your classroom, be yourself, be authentic, um, and don't try to imitate the style of someone else. It's a lot of work and it's super stressful. I'm sure we've all tried to do it at some point. Sticking to what you know and your comfort spot is going to come through and it's going to just run smoothly. It's going to teach with your passion. It's just a much nicer vibe. Um, you can take the time to practice. Like I said, it does take practice to do these things sometimes to sort of get into that rhythm and understand what works for you. Um, you can put a couple of lesson plans together, gather some friends and test it out and ask them to be honest with you. Don't, don't let them go easy. If they're struggling, get them to say, hey, I'm struggling and I need you to help me right now because that is what teaching is about. It's about learning to adapt to the individual requirements of others. You will deliver something and think you've covered all the bases and then someone will turn around and go, actually, I didn't really understand. Can you show me again? And that's great. Um, that's the process and I really love that. Um, but, yes, getting into that headspace of how you can adapt with the classes is something that comes with practice. Um, there will also be times when you've gotten to a point and you've um, over-catered or under-catered. So you're about to run over an hour or run under by half an hour. Sorry. Um, and th that's just part of the process. I've done that quite a few times. I still do that every now and then. But you become more comfortable with it. You you get used to it and you start picking um, when that may happen. And you're, again, being adaptable to that situation. 
Um, different locations, different locations require a different delivery um, and structure. So again, if you're working with that space where people can ask that one-on-one -on -one stuff, then yeah, for sure, um, that's one way of delivering. But if you're working, and that gives you a bit more leeway too, when you're delivering, if people can ask, you can bounce back with the room. If you're just delivering in a one way, so imagine downloading or buying a DVD where it's all that, you then need to think about what are all the different possibilities people could ask, and I've got to answer them within this space because they're not going to get the opportunity to ask them. So the next one we've got is marketing. So marketing includes your documentation, that's your um, photographic images and sometimes film and production. You can DIY or outsource that. If you're DIYing, jump on, check out some um, workshops um, and build those skills up. They're really great skills to have. If you don't have the time for it and you're going to outsource it, then make sure you include those costs in your costs of running the workshop. Um, you can outsource as many things as you want. You can outsource the actual marketing entirely. You just got to factor it into your budget. So with this, you need to include the production time. Um, so how long is it going to take you to create the thing, to be able to take a photo or a video of it, and then actually taking the photo with the video on it of it, to then move on to the next step, which is your graphic design. And that's like developing your posters and your call to actions and everything. And that can, again, be DIY or outsource. With your graphic design and marketing campaign, it's a way of you to tell your story and tell your audience what they are to expect. So, you know, really use that platform. You can just grab an image and throw it up and write a lot of text, but this is a space where you can actually start to connect with your audience and draw in the people that are interested in what you're doing just through the way that you present what you're doing. You may also want to use things like a graphic design software. There's heaps of that are readily available online these days. Um, or you could hand draw a poster. It's There's no right or wrong here. Like I said, it's about building that story, that branding about what your workshop's about. It's completely individual and you do what feels right. You may also try something and just think that wasn't great. Completely throw it out the window and do a different one the next time. So with marketing, when to start marketing depends on... Uh, what type of workshop you are running. So um, if you are running it a part of a program, they may require your information 12 months in advance. If you're doing it for yourself and you want to start marketing one to two months in advance, then you pick that date, say it's one month in advance, then you need to have all of your marketing and production and graphic design and everything ready to go by that date. That's not the date to start making it. That's the date for it to be done for you to publish and push out. You can... Um, oh, sorry. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, with that, uh, where to market, you can do it through social media. So newsletters, advertising online, that kind of stuff. Print would be posters, media, magazines, flyers. You could also do radio, billboards and signage and things like that. There's no one size fits all with marketing. It really depends on where your audience is. And I would definitely personally recommend multiple locations for marketing um, and doing it, you know, multiple times. Again, don't assume that people have seen it that one time. They may need to have a few little reminders. Selling tickets. Are you putting it on your website? Are you doing it like through an event hosting website? Are you... Um, are you in a partnership with someone else and they're going to sell the tickets on your behalf? Will you be doing them in person via email or in direct contact via phone call? Whichever it is, they get to, you know, you choose. Like there's no right or wrong ways to do this. You just want to make sure that the process is really streamlined um, so that you can keep a really accurate record of the people who have signed up for it and how much they have paid or if they need to pay more. Um, and it's also a way for you to instill confidence in the people when they're booking with you. Uh, workshops are pretty expensive sometimes and people are putting a big investment into it. The ticket selling process is a way for them to feel safe and secure, you know, and it's that first step um, towards working with you. On the day of the actual workshop, you will need to create a list of what you need and you'll check it twice over 100 times. Um so with your um, your checklist, have that done like well and truly before, a week before, so you know what you have. If you're doing a pop-up, then I would personally recommend packing the car or supplies if you can the day before. Um, things happen on the morning. You just want to get there straight away. If you are at the venue, um, again, 
then you want to get there nice and early. You always want to be there or try to, things happen, but you want to be there before the students rock up. You also want to get there and find your zen. Um, even before this, I deliver workshops all the time. I get nervous, butterflies. Um, so I got in, had a bit of a chat, drank my tea, just started finding my little bit of a chill before I got in and delivered it. Chatting to other students in the workshop and all that can really just make you feel comfortable before you start presenting. Uh, watch the time. If things are running over, let them know. If things are, you know, going to run short, also let them know. Just keep people involved in the process. When you're finished, check in with the students, um, see how they're feeling it, and um, restore the space exactly as you found it. Please don't leave messes for other people to clean up. And the last one is follow-up. So what to do once your workshop's done? Uh, feedback is always a good one or recommend that they leave reviews and things. Uh, you may actually require feedback from your, um, your you know, the grant or a partner, but it's also good to have that for yourself. Keeping really good um, quantitative and qualitative data is a great habit for yourself because you'll get to know how things are actually trending. You may look back on something favorably or um, something may be, make you a little anxious, but then you look at the data and stuff and it may actually tell you otherwise, whether it was a successful or unsuccessful event um, or the general feedback. Um, how you do that's entirely up to you. It could just be word of mouth. It could be doing surveys. It could be via emails. Again, how you collect all that is what feels best for you. And then there's post imagery and documentation of the workshop to your networks. Um, this is that telling people what you do. Share the excitement of the whole event. This is great content for um, what you're actually, um, you know, advertising to your networks and bringing other people in with it. And it just allows people from afar to be able to be connected into what you're doing without actually being there. And it might encourage them to come to the next one. Okay. Huh. So that's me done. <laughs> um, if you have any questions at all, I'm just going to have a look in the thing, uh, but please drop them into the chat box. I'm more than happy to answer anything right now. And yeah, thanks everyone. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you, Alex. That was such a wonderful presentation. Um, and you covered absolutely every element that I could possibly think of um, when delivering uh, and developing workshops. Um, so thank you very much for your time and for this information. Please take a breather and have a glass of water. Um, if anyone has questions, please pop them in the comment um, pop, uh, pop up box in the bottom corner just now. Um, speaking of wrap up and follow up, um, while we're waiting for some potential questions, I'll just mention that Flying Arts will send out some online feedback forms as well as some resources discussed today just by email following today's um, today's webinar. Oh, wonderful. I can see a question come in here from Anna. Um, Anna's question is about managing larger workshops. Um, and she's just mentioned... Um, that she has the opportunity to present to a few hundred people uh, over three workshops, um, but might be too much as a ceramic workshop. That is a great query, Anna. Um, Alex, do you have any advice for Anna? I, I do, actually. Um, not for ceramics, but I've been in a similar situation. Um, there's a few things to really consider with this. The first one is, is this something that's a really good opportunity for you or something that is just feeling really exciting and really overwhelming and you're grabbing at it and you're like, I've got to do this. So there's that, it's the first one. Um, if you then decide, actually, this is a great opportunity and I really want to make this work, is there a way for you to adapt what you're doing to be able to you know, deal with such a large audience? Can you break it down? Again, there'll be time constraints. Is that you know, a few hundred people in one go or across a day? Um, if it's across a day, can you create um, little cheat sheets and things that you can place out that people can kind of guide themselves through it a bit and you can weave your way through and help them? Or if it's more of a structured activity, Will it be able to be presented as something that's quite an easy thing to do that has really great results? Um, that way, if you do get stuck down with a few people that are struggling with it, a lot of people are going to be able to go with it. Uh, then the other thing is, 
if it's just that's a huge amount of people and you can't do it all by yourself, is there scope in the budget to bring in some helpers and assistants? This is a way for you to be able to work with and employ other artists and get those connections going. So there is definitely ways around it. Um, you just will just have to be extremely adaptable to what it is that you're delivering and how you're going to deliver it. Um, I hope that answers your question, Anna. Thank you for asking um, that question. Um, Kylie has asked whether you have a go-to place for templates, for example, risk assessments. Um, yes, so Google. I usually just type in uh, what it is exactly that I'm looking for, but then I also look at places like Flying Arts and other arts organisations because they may have a really great resource pool uh, already available that you might not be aware of or reaching out to places like Flying Arts because they may have these things available already. Um, so before I try to reinvent the wheel, I do like to look to other places that may have those things. It's also if you're working for a particular company that's asked for a risk assessment, they may have a template and you may just ask if you can use the template so you're sticking within the procedures that they use. Wonderful. Um, and Jody has a question as well. Is there a recommended insurance company that is good for artists? If it's okay, I might answer this one. Um, Jody, Flying Arts has a membership program which includes insurance for artists. There are only a couple art forms that we don't cover, and that's if you're a performing artist or if you work in film. Um, but if you are a visual artist, a uh, musician or an arts worker, um, please feel free to reach out and query your practice um, and we can link you up to our accredited membership, which includes insurance uh, and um, covers the teaching of workshops. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea has asked, um, do you know anything about getting workshops in schools? Um, can you approach them uh, and how do you find your audience? All right, so um, first of all, I'll, I'll tackle the school part of that question. Um, yes, you can definitely approach a school. Um, you can approach them as an artist in residence or a contract, um, but it's something that's not the same because you're not a school teacher. You're not um, registered, or you could be, but I'm just saying like if you're not registered uh, with like the education Queensland education, I think it is. Sorry, I am not a school teacher. Um, so there are ways around it and how you word and offer your services. If you have a local school um, that's asked for those things, then ask them how they would like to approach it. I do work with schools as an artist in residence. I come in and I either teach PD to other teachers or I offer workshops for the children. Um, and yeah, but I would, if you've got connections already, then I would ask them what they're sort of looking for. If you haven't, then advertise it as an artist in residence. As to the how do you find your audience, uh, that is a great question. That builds up over time. Um, it's word of mouth. People will continually come to you. But I, I think initially to start off, if you can go to events and stuff where there is an existing audience, particularly if it's an audience that is um, geared in the similar kind of way. Like if you're um, at a meat festival, they might not be looking for an arts experience. Um, but finding, you know, where your audience is hanging out and then trying to get into those spaces is going to help you build your audience. But word of mouth is really just how it you know, builds. It can be slow and then all of a sudden it'll just grow like an avalanche. <laughs> Um, and I think partnering with other organisations or other um, colleagues is a really great way to work together to build an audience as well. Um, so if you can, um, collaborating um, might be a good way to build it naturally too. Um, then we have got in the questions as well, I'll just scroll down to the next one. Um, Joan has asked, um, I teach workshops contractor for a local business. Do I need my personal insurance or am I covered by the business? That is a great question, Joan. Um, if it's okay, I might answer that one offline and give you a call after this webinar and we can um, chat about the workshops that you teach and a little bit more about um, the specifics uh, of your question. Okay, sounds great. Um, and then um, Kylie, oh, this is a great question. Um, the norm for refunds, 
Um, how do you offer refunds, Alex? Um, so on my advertise, um, on my advertise, on my website, um, I say that um, we don't offer refunds for change of mind. Um, there will be extenuating circumstances. Obviously, things happen. Um, but if someone has forgotten on the day or just decided that they weren't going to come, then that's a change of mind. No, I do not offer a refund. I've paid for the materials. They're holding the ticket space of someone who would couldn't be there. And in certain circumstances, I'm paying staff to host those sessions. Um, if it, you know, there are, with the extenuating circumstances, yes, there are times when you should be um, offering refunds. Uh, look up what the expectations are with the ACCC, particularly with like retail refunds and what you need to be doing. Uh, just because um, it doesn't feel right with you might not be what you could be legally doing. So always check that kind of stuff. Um, there are other ways that you can do it as offering gift vouchers and replacements or ways for people to attend workshops at a uh, future date. So it's a bit of a, it's not a yes, no answer. Um, it's very circumstance based. And yes, I would be definitely heading to the ACCC to start with to be looking at what are uh, your responsibilities in that particular instance as a business. Um, and when you do find out um, what you're comfortable uh, advertising with refunds as well, make sure that it's really clear would probably be my advice. Um, and I know with Flying Arts, um, we're a little bit different because we're an organisation, but um, we like to make sure that across all of our platforms and web pages that the um, terms and conditions of our refunds um, is, is quite clear. Um, and we've got a bit of a timeline structure. So if two weeks before the workshop uh, is scheduled to take place, you decide that you don't want to go, we'll offer a refund. But if it's any sooner than that, we won't. So there's, yeah, as Alex has said, it's not exactly a yes or no. It depends on your own personal circumstances, the type of workshop that it is. But once you land on something, having the terms and conditions of the refund really clear um, is, is quite yeah. important. Um, um, if, oh, sorry, Alex. Sorry, I just want to speak to one thing that I think this also leads into really quickly is the whole no-shows, people saying they're going to be there and not showing up. One of the ways around that is payment in full or um, asking for a deposit. People will be more committed if they've already put money down for something. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if no one has any other questions, we might leave the discussion there for today. But I'll just mention again, um, if you did have anything else that comes up over the next uh, little bit while you're still thinking about this uh, webinar, please feel free to direct any more questions to that program lead at flyingarts.org.au email address. And I can try and um, field the questions or refer you to Alex. Um, I'll be sending a feedback form out shortly, as well as some resources, and this particular webinar in about a week or so will be available online on Flying Arts's uh, YouTube account, um, and I'll send out a link to everyone who's attended today. But thank you so much for being here with us, and um, thank you again, Alex, for your time and sharing your expertise uh, on the topic of um, teaching workshops and teaching your craft. Um, thank you. Uh, and I might leave the webinar there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>